only belief that our efforts would bring to light a story too horrible to be detailed induced me to help my mother destroy evidence of my union with Evelyn. Why, man? What induced you? <laughs> because my mother told me that Evelyn and I were brother and sister. Ah, so that was it. But she lied. This old Beldame has confessed to me that my mother deceived me. Our union was lawful, and it was blessed by a child. My wife gave birth before she died. I have... I had... a wee boy. What became of him? I do not know. And now you wish to ascertain his fate? And do justice to the honour of Evelyn. Will you help me? With all my heart. Old Buck takes Lord Geraldin to Monk Barnes to fortify him with food and wine and to show him certain private relics in his cabinet. I have here a bundle of papers tied with a black ribbon. Examinations taken by Jonathan Old Buck, JP, upon the circumstances surrounding an untimely death. Ehu Evelina. Alas, indeed. Among these papers is a deposition. Here I have it. On the night of the death, a child was carried from the cottage at Craig Bunfoot and taken in a carriage and four by, by your brother, huh? Edward Geraldine Neville. Oh! I traced the journey for several stages. I believed your brother had taken steps to remove a child stigmatized by illegitimacy. I now conceive he may have believed the shame to be yet more indelible. But uh, you think, then, that the child may have survived? Well, why not? Your brother, God rest his soul, was an honourable man. We must set on foot inquiries. I will write to my brother, steward. Oh, Mr. Oldbuck, I cannot express to you how much your cooperation in this dark and most melancholy business gives me relief and confidence. Our scene changes again. Let us travel once more over the sands and treacherous cliffs to the castle of Knockwinnock, where Sir Arthur Warder, although escaped from drowning, now struggles and sinks under his financial embarrassments, and his daughter Isabel regards him with an anxious eye. You will be happy to hear, sir, that Lieutenant Taffrell's brig has got safe into Leith Roads. There had been apprehensions for his safety. And for that of Mr. Lovell, I suppose. And what is Lieutenant Taffrell and his gun brig to me? What do I care who is saved or lost? I thought you would be happy to Oh, hear... I am happy. And to make you happy too, you shall have some of my good news. Read this. What is it? Read it aloud. I, I see the contents are unpleasant. Oh, not so. They will accommodate us by taking our horses and plates, that's all. Scoundrels. I shall write him a proper answer. But why should I take up my time in reply? I shan't always be kept in prison, I suppose. In prison, sir? Aye, debtor's prison. Oh, father. But our family, our friends, is there no one to help? I have exhausted their kindness. Shall I send to Monk Barnes? To what purpose? Old Buck cannot lend me the sum we need. He knows we are drowned in debt. But he is shrewd and sensible. Go Take your walk, dear child. Now you know the worst. I would be alone for a while. Miss Isabel goes out as she is told, but not before dispatching a servant to summon Mr Oldbuck. Then she wanders into a little glen, overhung with larch and hazel, in which she once, not so long ago, had such a distressing encounter with poor Lovell. She now recalls every word by which he pressed and she refused his suit. Thoughts of regret press in upon her as, at a turn in the path, she meets Eddie Ockletree out upon his rounds. Oh, my bonny lady. Eddie! I've been wishing muckle to meet with you. Here I am. And if you can, what's hanging over your father's house? Great distress, so I fear, Eddie. Clean the bailiff's man will be there the day we always tackle. Are you sure? Even as I tell you, lady. But, 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 dinner not be cast down. There's a heaven over your head here, as, as well as in that fearful night when the waters rose. 
Oh, if I had a good horse. Where would you go? I have sent to Mr. Oldbuck. But, uh, but there is another place I can. Mark haste, my bonny lady. Find me a horse for the love of goodness. Mr. Oldbuck is out walking with his nephew Hector, now recovered from his wound, when the messenger sent from Miss Isabel reaches them. Something very particular has happened, and Miss Isabel begs you will come without delay. Oh, I can guess what this is, nephew. Aye, Sir Arthur's course is drawing to a close. What can I do? Do, sir. Go, right away. But Sir Arthur's griefs are beyond our cure. I cannot think of their distress, of poor Miss Isabel, without wishing to show some sympathy at least. I will run on and announce you coming. As you wish, Hector, though you might save your... breath. By the time Captain Hector McIntyre enters the courtyard of Knockwinnock Castle, the bailiffs have already taken possession. He sees the fair Isabel standing with the beggar, Eddie Ockletree, and gazing dumbly upon her father's ruin. Dear Miss Warder, my uncle is coming and I'm sure he will find some way to clear the house of these rascals. Alas, Captain McIntyre, I fear it will be too late. Captain, could I ever get a horse? I'll do this family the best day's doing since time began. What good could you do, old man? Come, let's yoke yon cart. But wh- humour him, Captain. Yes, see, time is precious. Very well, my lady. Hold steady there. I beg your pardon. You must remove nothing here or you will be liable for the consequences. What the devil, sir? Have you the impudence to prevent us from carrying out this young lady's wishes? Captain McIntyre, sir, I have no quarrel with you. But if you interrupt me in my duty, I must declare myself de force. And who the devil cares? I will break your bones if you prevent me from harnessing this horse. I take all who stand here to witness that I showed him my blazon. I declare... What the juice is the matter here? Mr. Sweetclean? The man has insulted Lady Isabel. Sweetclean? Sir? You know me. I am Justice of the Peace. Sir? We'll have no divorcement here. Let them harness the horse. It will be back again soon enough. Give them an hour or two. As you wish, sir. Miss Isabel, shall we go and see your father? If you please, Mr. Oldbuck. Mr. Oldbuck is here, father. Sir Arthur. Always happy to see friends, in fair weather or foul. This sad business of yours, can nothing be done? You may read the charge. Mm. Is there no remedy? Are we ruined, Mr. Oldbuck? Well, I hope not, but this demand is very large, and others will doubtless come in now. I never doubt that. Where the slaughter is, the eagles will be gathered together. I'm like a sheep fallen from a precipice. I will not be on the heather ten minutes before half a dozen crows will be pecking out my eyes. Sir Arthur, uh, let us have some conversation on the state of your affairs uh, and see what we can do. Shall we go into the library? Very well. All morning they are shut up together until Miss Isabel interrupts them, pale of face and dressed in her travelling clothes. Behind her come Mr Sweepclean and Captain Hector, both heated. This gentleman says he can wait no longer. He must attend upon us. Oh, let like the damned scoundrel wait. Mr. Oldbuck, sir, your nephew holds very uncivil language, and I have borne too much of it already. His highland blood is up. He'll be fighting a duel again. Come, Mr. Sweep Clean, give us a little more time. I know you won't wish to hurry, Sir Arthur. By no means, sir, but I am not justified in holding my prisoner any longer. Unless I am to get payment of the sums specified. Oh, I'll send him to the right about. Foolish boy, be quiet. The fellow's only doing his miserable duty, and you will make matters worse by opposing him. I fear, Sir Arthur, you must accompany this man to Fairport. There is no help for it. Let it be so. Uh, my nephew will escort Miss Isabel to Monk Barnes. No, sir. I go with my father. I have prepared his clothes and my own. <laughs> We must go, then, to jail. And what of that? It's only a place we can't get out of, after all. (laughs) Suppose a fit of the gout, and this house would be the same. (laughs) Hey, old buck, we'll call it a fit of the gout, hmm? only without the damned pain. As Sir Arthur and his daughter prepare to enter the carriage which is waiting to take them away to distraint and disgrace, the cart upon which Eddie Ockletree has set out upon his mysterious errand comes tearing into the courtyard and Eddie tumbling off it. 
Stop! Stop! My habit! Of what, old fellow? Epistolary correspondence! Here you are, sir. God save the king! What is all this? Mr. Sweep Clean? Sir? You must sweep yourself off with all your attendants, rag, tag, and bobtail. Who's to pay my charges? Seest thou this paper? Ah, weel. I thought it would be a queer thing if ultimate diligence was done against sick a gentleman as Sir Arthur. I'll go my ways. What is it? Old Mark! A draft upon the bankers of Fairport, sir, in your favour, uh, to the sums demanded and beyond. Be of good cheer. See, here, in good clerkly hand. Uh, but how? Who? Ah, oh, that we are to discover. But this at least deserves celebration. You could do justice to a glass of burgundy, old friend, as well could I. <laughs> While the party celebrates, Mr. Oldbuck follows his antiquarian instincts and makes his investigations among the ancient relics of his acquaintance. Eddie. Sir? You knew. You knew there was good tidings. How was that? What, sir, from Mr. Lovell? Lovell? You've been in correspondence with him? Aye. Where is he? How is he? I just got a scrape of a pen for him to say there would be a packet at Tannenborough with letters of great consequence to the Knockwinnock folk. And how does he have to do with this business? Where the devil has he been? Oh, that I cannot tell you, sir, without contradicting his positive orders. I reckon he had to see somebody at Edinburgh before he could move in this matter. Hmm. Hmm. Uncle, Sir Arthur wishes to drink a glass with you. Uh, in a moment. In and have some meat, Eddie. You've earned it. Aye, sir. Oh, well. Hector? Uncle. A word with you. The Burgundy is an excellent wine. Hector... I am sometimes inclined to suspect that in one respect you are a fool. In one only? One par excellence. I have sometimes thought that you have cast your eyes upon Miss Warder. Well, sir. Well, sir. As though it were the most reasonable thing in the world for a humble captain to marry a baronet's daughter. I presume to think there would be no degradation for Miss Warder. And in point of fortune... We are pretty even, since neither of us have got any. There may be an error, but I cannot plead guilty to presumption. But here lies the error, Hector. She won't have you. Indeed, sir. I must inform you she likes another man, so I advise you to beat your retreat, draw off your forces, for the fort is too well garrisoned for you to storm it. I shall not break my heart for Miss Warder. Why, Hector, I was afraid of a scene. I thought you were desperately in love. You would have me desperately in love with a woman that does not care about me. Ah, there is some sense in what you say. Yet I would have given a good deal some twenty years since to have been able to think as you do. In any case, I must quit this company soon and go to Edinburgh. I see Major Neville is arrived there. I should like to see him. Who the devil is Major Neville? Oh, a very distinguished young officer. I have had occasion to hear a good deal of him. We have several mutual friends. The antiquary wanders out of the castle courtyard, over the bridge that spans the moat and onto the green sward. He gazes idly at the mossy walls of the old keep, and one corner of his mind runs on the sieges and battles they have seen, while another ponders more recent events. After a while, to him enters fair young Miss Isabel. Mr. Oldbuck. My dear. My father says a note has come from a Major Neville, asking if he might pay his respects. We wondered if you might know this person. I might, uh, but I cannot say for sure. Perhaps he may explain our stroke of fortune. Perhaps. My father bade him come and be welcome. That is good, for I see a rider approaching. Indeed, I see too. Two horsemen are indeed approaching the castle. One, coming from Glenallan, is at some distance, but the other, moving swiftly along the Tannenborough Road, is almost upon them. I wonder, I seem to recognise this rider, do you? Is it Major Neville? I think we knew him as Lovell. Oh! He wants to talk to you, not me, my dear. Why do you not go to him now? I... Go along, go along. See, he's waiting for you. 
As she goes to meet the dismounted officer, the other rider approaches at a more genteel pace. It is Lord Geraldine. Old Buck. My lord. I heard Sir Arthur was in difficulties. I came to give what assistance I could. No need, my lord. The day is saved. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. Who do we have to thank for such an act? I believe a Major Neville. I've not met such a person. He bears my poor brother's name. Uh, you may know him, sir. He is yonder, talking to Miss Isabel. Hmm. He is very familiar with her. They are old friends. Is he not familiar to you too, my lord? Good God. He's so strikingly like... Like the unfortunate Evelyn. Uh, I felt my heart warm to him from the first, and now I feel I know why. But who is he? I surmise your brother brought him up as his natural son. The poor young man thought he was illegitimate, and now he has discovered otherwise. Gracious heaven! It is my child! Mr. Oldbuck. Sir. You have a claim on me, sir, for having passed myself under a false name and injured your nephew. Uh, you served him as he deserved, and now, sir, allow me to have the pleasure of introducing a son to a father. Father? My son. We will not attempt to describe such a meeting. But in the evening of that day, all were bidden to Glen Allen, where the yeomanry drank to the prosperity of the new heir and young master. A month afterwards, this fortunate youth was married to Isabel Warder, the antiquary making the lady a present of a ring. A massy circle of antique chasing, bearing the motto of my ancestor, Aldebrand Oldenbuck. <laughs> Curious inscription, partially erased, which some argue embodies a dog. In The Antiquary by Walter Scott, Old Buck was played by Richard Wilson, Eddie by Alexander Morton, Sir Arthur Stuart McGugan, Isabel Melody Grove, Lovell Dominic Rye, Geraldine Christian Rodska, Tafril Charles Davis, Hector John Walk, Caxon Sweet Clean and Leslie David Hayden, Elspeth and Maggie Beth Tucky, and the servant and the boy, Felix Ortona, with David Tennant as Walter Scott. The music was composed by Ross Hughes and Esmond Chalva, and the cello was played by George Cook. The play was dramatised for radio by Robin Brooks, and produced and directed by Clive Brill. It was a Brill production for BBC Radio 4.